let's get right to the word of God. You ready? Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. One verse. Very familiar, but this is where the Lord is going to be speaking to us from. Amen? Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. It says this. Being confident of this very thing. Yep. That he which has begun a good work in you shall perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Father, yeah. Father, bless your word today in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to continue with our third installment of our impact series, and I want to talk about the impact of consistency. We've been talking about the impact of communication, God speaking and us speaking for him or speaking through us. We talked about the impact of commitment. This week, I want to talk about the impact of consistency. It may sound like I'm saying the same thing, but I'm really not. Because commitment means I've decided to undertake a work. I accepted the assignment. Some people struggle with commitment issues. So last week, we had to deal with people who were wrestling with the ability to commit, to pick a lane, pick a team, pick a side. Some people are so indecisive, you can't be effective in your family, your business, or your church because you never can pick a side. You can't pick a team. You, you live in the land of indecisiveness. And so we talked about the impact of commitment. But now I want to talk about the consistency. I want to talk about the impact of consistency. Commitment means I've decided. Consistency means I continue. It's not just that I started. I continue. Because what good is it starting something if you're not going to continue? One of the greatest things I love about God is, is his consistency. God, God doesn't start anything that he doesn't finish. He that hath begun, that's the start, that's the commitment. I've begun, shall perform it. That word perform means to execute, to bring to completion, to bring to fulfillment. Follow me, beloved of God. Success in any endeavor depends on remaining commitment to a course of action. It ain't just starting, it's sticking with it. We are, get this, we are what we consistently do. It's not what we do every once in a while that defines us. It's what you do consistently that defines who you are. How do I break it down for you? You're not going to lose weight by spending one day at the gym. It's what you do consistently that causes you to lose weight. Come on, talk to me, somebody. You're not going to save money one week and become a millionaire. You're not going to sow a tithe one Sunday. It's what you continuously do. You see what I'm saying? I can always count on God because God is always who he's going to be. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13, 8 says, in Malachi, he says, I am the Lord God. I change not. In James, he said, there's no shadow of turning in me. People are not always who they're supposed to be, but I can always count on God to be who he is supposed to be. So when we talk about God's love toward us, why is that important? Because when we talk about God's love toward us, it's not just what he does, it is who he is. Can I talk about the isness of God? He is love. That's why he loves. He is just. That's why he, is the, that's why he justifies. He is righteousness. That's why he always does the right thing. He is merciful. That's why he always gives mercy. God will not do anything that is not consistent with who he is. Everything he says, everything he does is consistent with his nature, with who he is. It's not just that he gives it, I am it. And what you see coming out of my behavior is a reflection of who I am. And wherever you find me, I'm going to consistently be me. Ooh, see, that's why I love God more than anybody else. Because people, because of our nature, we flip-flop. We're wishy-washy. We're sometimes this, we're sometimes that. Sometimes I'm for you, sometimes I'm not. Sometimes I got you, sometimes I don't. But God is consistently God. If he ever loved you, he does love you, and he will love you. <laughs> Y'all didn't catch that. I said, if God does love you, 
If God ever loved you, he does love you and he will love you. That's not contingent upon what you gave, who you are, where you live. He says, I love you with an everlasting love. You can always count on me loving you. Your mama might not love you. Your daddy might not love you. Your friends might walk all on you, walk out on you. But one thing I can depend on is God being who he is. He's faithful. Oh, my God. Don't push me because I ain't ready to go there yet. <laughs> 2 Timothy 2.13 says this, that even if you are faithless, he remains faithful. <laughs> Ooh, I'm so excited. I can't already contain myself. Even when you flake out, God said, I'm going to still be who I am. See, some people think that God blesses you because he's co-signing on your foolishness. But the truth be told, the fact is that God sometimes blesses you and you don't even deserve it. You haven't always been faithful. You haven't always done right. You haven't always sown. You haven't always lived right. But he still blesses you because God said, that's who I am. And just because I bless you don't mean I'm co-signing on your foolishness. It's just that just because you're faithless, I'll still remain faithful. I can't deny myself. Oh. God's actions are always consistent with his word. The spirit and the word agree. Anybody that's telling you that the Spirit led them to do something and it's not consistent with the Word of God is lying to you. God said, I'm not like you. My words and my actions are always consistent. My Word and my Spirit, we don't fall out. We don't have an argument. We don't, you know how it is sometimes with your own self. Sometimes your mind telling you one thing, but your body saying something else, and then mind saying, don't do this, and, and you have that struggle within yourself. God said, I never have that struggle. Because I don't do anything. I don't say anything that's not consistent with what I think and what I feel. Can I go deeper? So let me ask you a question. How do people describe you? How, what, what do people say about you when they say, you always do this? Like when they say your name, what word, what comes, what word comes to their mind? Uh, he's, he's always on time. She's always dressed nice. She's always got a pleasant word. She's always given encouragement. She always smiles. He always helps. Or he's always late. <laughs> he never shows up. He never does what he's supposed to do. What, what do people say about you that, 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 that last week, let me go here. Last week, we talked about the impact of your reputation, your name, and how important it is that you protect your brand. Anybody remember that? How important it is to protect your brand. Your brand is your name, is your reputation. It's what people know you for. And sometimes we've done things that have damaged our brand. That sometimes we've done things that have ruined our reputations. I want to talk to somebody who's trying to overcome a bad reputation. That there are times when we have done things that have been inconsistent, even as Christians. Even as Bible-believing Christians. Have you ever lost your temper? Have, have you ever been in an embarrassing situation where everybody in your office knows that you're supposed to be a Christian or a deacon or a pastor or whatever, and you said something because they made you mad, and they say, I thought you was a Christian? <laughs> has, has anybody ever went off on your kids? See, I wish those kids, see, y'all took the kids out of service. Deacon, go get the kids, bring them all right back in here, because I want to talk to the kids. Because y'all some people talking about, I never, let me talk to them kids. Them kids going to tell the real story. <laughs> you remember I talk about, I'm so-and-so and so-and-so and so, and the kids be looking at you because they know how you really are when we're not around. And that's all of us. If you live long enough, you're going to do some things that are not consistent. If you live beyond two minutes on this earth, you're going to do something that's not consistent. But the question becomes, how do I fix my reputation once I've damaged it, is it possible? Is there a way? And the answer is yes, through consistency. Consistency, write this down. Consistency changes the narrative. Whatever they're saying about you, whatever's written about you, whatever's said in the streets about you, no matter how bad it is, consistency can change the narrative. That when people are saying things negative about you, some of the things they said were true. Can I get one witness in here? That's some, but, but you can begin to repair your, 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 your name, your, your reputation, by being consistent. How do I know? Let me prove to you. Paul had a bad reputation. 
When he got saved, my God, he was known for being a Christian killer, tearing up churches everywhere. And when God saved him, God had to talk to the disciples, in particular Ananias, and say, go down there and lay hands on Paul. And Ananias said, I'm not going, Lord. He got a reputation. He got a reputation for killing folk. And God had to speak up and say, he's praying now. Is there anybody that's ever damaged their brand so bad that God had to speak up for you? I'm going to talk to somebody who's had a bad reputation, who's had things that you did wrong, that you did crazy, and it's not what they're lying on you. You did it for real. It's documented. We got videos and everything. See, that's the bad thing about today, Charita. You can Google somebody now. <laughs> you can Google search. I can find out about your ex-wife, your ex-husband, your last job, your last pastor. I can just Google you and find out something about you, right? Anybody ever had to deal with some stuff that followed you? Anybody ever had a reputation that was so bad that people still know you by what you did? You know your reputation is bad when they don't even call you by your name. They name you by what you did. The woman caught in adultery. She ain't got no name. <laughs> What's her name, adulteress? That's when your reputation is so bad that they, they don't even know your name. That girl, him, right there, the drug dealer. What's his name? I don't know. He's the big drug dealer on the corner. Paul had a reputation for being a Christian killer so bad that the disciples didn't even want to touch him. That when he got ready, to, he was already preaching and stuff. When he got ready to hook up with the disciples, the, the, the apostles, the Bible said in the book of Acts, didn't even want to deal with him. Because they had heard that he was a Christian killer. Interesting note here. They had heard that he was a Christian killer, but they never heard about his conversion. And isn't it bad? Isn't it something how long, how pervasive bad news is? That you can do a thousand things right. But the one thing you did wrong is the thing that sticks with you. They had heard that he was a Christian killer. They heard he tore up churches, but nobody heard about his conversion. Nobody heard about Damascus Road experience. Nobody heard about his baptism. Nobody, even Ananias didn't come and say, you know, Paul's preaching now. Even he didn't show up. You know what kills most of our reputations? It's not bad. It's not good people. It's not bad people's strength. It's good people that don't say anything about it. That your critics and your enemies end up speaking louder than the people who support you. That you can have somebody in the streets running you down real bad, and there are people who genuinely love you, but they won't speak for you. Even Ananias didn't say nothing in Paul's defense. <laughs> so when he came around the disciples, they didn't even want to fool with him. And it was this disciple named Barnabas that took him to the apostles and vouched for him. And convinced them that he was who he said he was. Every once in a while, you got to have a Barnabas in your life. Barnabas had a reputation. Barnabas had influence. Barnabas had clout. Barnabas was somebody they respected. And what he did was he risked his own reputation by associating with somebody who had a bad reputation. And even though his bad reputation was following him, he convinced them, this boy's all right. What we need in church are people who will vouch for you. It's not that God hasn't already anointed him. God anointed him. He was already preaching. He was already ministering. Ananias had already laid hands on him. He was already going forth. But in order for him to have influence in the community that he was sent to, sometimes it requires somebody who is on the inside who can speak for you. Paul was a newbie. He was a stranger. He just got there. Barnabas had the influence, the clout, the connections, and he used his influence to allow them to say, this guy is okay. He's good. I've spent time with him. Here's the thing. I spent time with him. If Paul had been somebody who was inconsistent, who was in and out, who was here and there, he couldn't have vouched for him, but he spent time with him, Carmen. And even though they didn't know him, he spent time with him. He saw God using him. He heard God using him. He watched God do a thing in his life. And so when he came to the other people who didn't know him, he was saying, that boy's all right. And because he vouched for him, all the other disciples allowed him to move freely among them. What we need, oh my God, Barnabas' ministry is so pervasive because I think it's important that you have people who are speaking in the community for you. We all need that. 
Because sometimes people, they are speaking in places that you may not have influence. They've already written you off, said, no, 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 we're not fooling with them. So you need somebody on the inside. Barnabas' ministry is so uh, fascinating to me because as I read his life, I don't read where he started any churches. He wasn't no pastor anywhere. He wasn't no bishop. He didn't write no, no books of the Bible. In fact, his whole ministry was making sure that Paul's reputation, the narrative about him, was changed. That what they were saying about him, Barnabas was there to say, but he's good now. He, that's true. He did do that. He did say that. He did kill those people, but he's good now. Yeah, one person got it. I, Barnabas' whole ministry, he wasn't trying to get the stage. He wasn't trying to be important. He wasn't trying to be in front of nobody. His whole call, he sensed that his calling at that moment Barnabas was a connector. But whatever you read about him in the book of Acts, he's somebody who's connecting people, who brings people into the room that wouldn't normally get in the room together. That's Barnabas. And so he brings Paul into the room because he sensed that his purpose at that moment was making sure that they changed the narrative about Paul. If they didn't accept Paul, it was going to hamper the work of the ministry that God wanted to do through him. It was important that those disciples connect, that they get together, that they join forces. And so Barnabas was the connector. And his job was to make sure that the narrative about him is changed. If you want to get over a bad reputation, keep doing a good thing. That's the only thing you can do. That though they knew what you did then, you've changed, but now you got to keep doing what you do now. Until that which they see about you now overshadows what they knew about you then. You're not going to talk to me. You're not going to talk to me in here. So if you're going to overcome a bad reputation, Michael, you got to be consistent. Ain't no need to get mad at them because they talked about who you were. Just give them something new to chew on. Give them something new to talk about. Anybody remember when Lazarus was raised from the dead and the Bible said that, that, that he who was dead was sitting at the table with Jesus? Did you catch that? He who was dead. Yeah, we saw you die. We saw you go down. We saw you get thrown in the tomb. But now he who was dead was sitting at the table with Jesus. What am I saying? I'm saying that you can't help where you've been, but you can change where you're going. You got to keep on living right. You got to keep on doing right. You got to keep on serving right. And they might not get it the first time. They might not get it the second time. They might not get it the fourth time. But you just keep on doing it until the narrative changes. He who was dead, let me break it down to you. She that was a prostitute, he that was a drug addict, he that was a... I was adulterer, I was a fornicator, I was whatever I was, but I'm now something else. I have to be that something else I am now consistently until I change people. Oh my God. Look at somebody say, be consistent. Stop getting mad and getting upset and throwing off on people on Facebook because they talked about what you were. Just give them something new to talk about and be consistent at it. If you're a new person now, continue to be the new person you are now until the narrative changes. Can I move on? I got to move on. Consistency requires this. Consistency requires that you have something called endurance. You have to endure hardness as a, as a, as a good soldier in Christ. This generation boasts about having the ability to cut people off quick. Yeah, I cut you off. I leave you. I leave people. I leave situations, and I brag about it. But our parents and our grandparents, they brag about being able to stand up to something. Yeah, this generation can't take nothing. The wrong thing, I'm out. I'm gone. Deuces, I'm gone. And we brag about being unstable. Now, listen, let me, let me, let me be clear. I'm not talking about situations where you're being abused. I'm not talking about somebody uh, where you're threatened uh, emotionally or physically. You got to get out of there. You just got to go. I mean, that's, that's non-negotiable. But I'm not talking about that. Everything doesn't qualify as that kind of situation. There are some things that we just don't take because there's something broken down in us. And it's hard to be consistent on the outside when you're a broken person on the inside. Can I take my time? 
It's hard to be somebody who's stable on the outside when you're not stable on the inside. That's why you can't keep a job. That's why you can't keep a relationship. That's why you can't be stable and consistent. That's why nobody can count on you because there's something broken down in me. It doesn't matter. I can change cities, change spouses, change jobs, but the same thing keeps happening. It's not them. There's something broken in me. Someone lift your hand and say, God, fix what's broken in me. Whatever it is that makes me the kind of person that can't stand up to nothing. If you're going to be anything in God, you got to be able to stand up to some stuff. Everybody's not going to like you. and Everybody's not going to support you. and Everybody's not going to treat you right. And Kool-Aid's not going to come out the water fountain. And everybody's not going to love you right. But you got to endure hardness as a good soldier. you got to stand up to some stuff. You can't run off every time something go wrong. you got to be somebody I can stand there. I'm going to take it. Endure hardness. So consistency requires that you're somebody who can stand up to stuff. Because everything is not going to go your way. Look at this. Look at this. Consistency is measured over time. There's a time factor involved. You can't get married today and claim I'm faithful. <laughs> no. You just got married yesterday. You woke up in the morning and said, well, I'm faithful. No. Faithfulness has to be proven over time. Come on, somebody. That's all marriage is. Marriage is honoring a commitment over time. You only been on a job for two weeks, and now you want to be employee of the month. Can you make it to the month yet? <laughs> you know what I mean? They kickle me. You, you've been pastoring for a year, and you're ready for them to coronate you a bishop. Really? Can you do something for a while? Let us watch you for a minute and see. Mentoring takes time. Development takes time. Discipleship takes time. There is a time factor involved in consistency. Some of you, you're marrying folk too quick. You're giving them jobs too quick. You're giving them responsibility too quick. Discipleship, mentoring, all those things take time. Oh, can I move on? Can I go deeper? Consistency is a skill set. Anybody can get married. Why do I keep going back to these marriage metaphors? Because the marriage metaphor helps me understand or help me connect with you what I'm saying about commitment, about consistency. Anybody can get married. That's easy. Just go down to the JP, say a couple words, sign a piece of paper, give them a check, I'm married. It's easy. Anybody can get married. It's staying married. That's the problem. Some of us, we're good at catching. You're just not good at keeping. Y'all quiet. Huh? Did I hear? Y'all quiet? Oh my God. You can, you got the equipment. No doubt about that. You can get them. You can get them. You know, you to the left. I'll get somebody just like you tomorrow, right? You're good at that. You're just not good at keeping. And you can't have a significant impact on anything if you're somebody who is a catch and release person. Some people go to the fishing hole, they have those catch and release, you know, they go fishing. You, you, you spend all that time out there fishing, when you catch them, you got to throw them back. Some of you are good at catching, but you're not good at keeping. You can get a job. You can go into an interview and amaze them with your interview skills. Got the job. You just can't stay on the job more than two weeks. You can, you can dazzle us with your ability and what you have to do, but you don't stay. So consistency requires a certain skill set. Look at this. Write this down. Consistency fosters good relationships because good relationships are built on trust. Being consistently, write this, being consistently inconsistent breaks trust. You can't establish good relationships with people who are inconsistent. Inconsistency kills intimacy. I'm going to let that marinate. Inconsistency kills intimacy. Because you can't build on people that you can't trust. And here's, here's how I cycle people that are inconsistent. It bothers me, Michael, because this is where I go. My head goes here. It cycles. I go from anticipation to concern to anger to indifference. <laughs> in that order. I go from anticipation because I'm excited about what you promised. Oh, you're going to do that? You're going to come? You're going to show up? 
You're going to serve? Oh, my God. I'm anticipating it. I'm so excited for you. And then when you don't show up, my first thought is concern. What happened? Did they get in a car accident? Were they in the ER? Did something happen? I'm, I'm concerned. I'm calling. I, I, I know you said you're going to be here, but you didn't come. You all right? And then when I realize there's nothing wrong, I go to anger. <laughs> Maybe that's a too strong a word. Frustration. I went from anticipation to concern to frustration, but I ain't done yet, Mark. Then I go to indifference. And indifference means I don't care. Indifference means I've stopped depending on you. Indifference means I don't expect you. Indifference basically means if you do show up three days late, I'd be like, oh, how you doing? Really don't care by that point. So it's hard for us to have a relationship because now we're operating from a position of indifference. I don't care if you come or not. And a whole lot of relationships have been damaged because one or two or both of the persons have gotten to a place where it just don't matter. Oh, my God, to have damaged your reputation to the point that people just don't care. Well, they don't care if you show. That's when you're bad. You should be the kind of employee that people care if you come or not. If you leave the job and they celebrate, that's a bad thing. <laughs> if you leave a position and they glad about it, that's a bad thing. If, if you leave the house and she ain't worried, that's a bad thing. <laughs> Why? Because I moved to indifference because, don't blame me, I moved to this place because of your inconsistency. Bible says this, Proverbs 24, 21, do not meddle with those who are given to change. That's what the Bible says. I didn't say that. And what it's speaking about, it's not talking about people who evolve and grow and change. It's not talking about that. But it's speaking about people who are inconsistent in their behavior towards you. It's hard to find people who will consistently love you, consistently support you, consistently speak well of you, consistently be kind to you, who can find a faithful man is what Proverbs asked. Even God has a hard time finding somebody faithful. Who can I send and who shall go for us? Speaking all over the world, who can I find to speak for me? One man shows up and says, here my Lord, send me. A good man or a good woman is hard to find. So God's ability to impact my life is rooted in his consistency. That's why he's able to do so much in me, because he's consistent at it. That's why he's able to bring about change in my life, because once God gets started, he don't stop till he finish. He doesn't walk in and touch my life and then walk away. God gets involved and he stays on you like a project. Oh, my God. Think about somebody with a clay in their hands. He stays on you like a project until you get done. And even if you fool around and get marred in his hands, he don't throw it away. He keeps on working with you. How many here are glad that God kept on working with you? That truth be told that if God would have gave up on me, I wouldn't even be here. That if God, oh, my God, that I've done enough stuff that God should have threw me on the trash heap. So if you see me worshiping and see me praising God and see me bowing down and see me falling on my face, it ain't no show, baby. I just know that if God had not been thrilling my life, I wouldn't even be here. Is there anybody in here who's glad that God didn't throw you away? Give God a shout right here. I said, give God a shout right here. Aren't you glad that God is consistent? Aren't you glad that he's not like people? Aren't you glad that God doesn't give up easily? Aren't you glad that God doesn't get frustrated and throw you in the trash can? Aren't you glad that God knows all your secrets and your faults, but he loves you anyway? Aren't you glad that when he called you, he already calculated everything you was going to go through, but he called you anyway? I'm, I'm glad. God. Okay. All right. Come back. So we know that about God. <laughs> yeah. But how do we develop that in ourselves? I'm glad you asked. Write this down. Number one, you got to develop, if you're going to be a consistent person, right? Because God is consistent with us, it allows him to have a significant impact on my life. So if we're going to have a significant impact on people, on this community, on this church, in this city, we're going to have to be people who are consistent. It's not good enough to have one good hot service. 
we have to have consistent quality service. Who wants to go to a restaurant that's sometimey? Sometime they cook good, sometime they don't. Just depending on what day of the week it is. Depending on what day you show up. We, we had good fries yesterday. We ain't got them today. We had some good ribs yesterday. You come back on Thursday, we'll have them again. No, if I come, every time I come, I want to be consistent. The community expects that from our church. Whether it's our worship, whether it's the way we greet people, whether it's the way we preach, whatever we do, if we do it good, they expect you to be good at that at all times. And when you are consistently inconsistent, people get annoyed with you and stop coming. Because I never know what I'm going to get. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me pick which Sunday I'm going to come because I got to figure out this is going to be a good hot Sunday and I'm going to come. None. We need to have consistent ministry going on every Sunday. Every time I hit the door, there's somebody greeting me with a smile. It can't be, well, this is third Sunday and that's when they have the nice people come. <laughs> So one, you need a system. Write this down. Develop a system. A system is just a way or a process for doing things. Great organizations are built on good systems, not emotions. Did you get that? Great organizations are built on systems, not emotions. We want to build everything on emotions. How I feel today, how I feel about you today, how I'm feeling about myself today. And if I feel good today, if the sun is shining, if it's warm weather, I'm going to do good. But if it's not, I'm not going to do good. But you can't build anything like that. You can't build a business being somebody who work when you want to. Where are my entrepreneurs at in here? If you're going to make consistent money, you can't be somebody who's going to work today and not going to work tomorrow. you got to keep turning that wheel every day. Come on and talk to me, somebody. And the reason why some people who are entrepreneurs and they fail is because they don't go after it like they go after a job every day. You gotta go. In fact, if you're an entrepreneur, you got to work harder than you would if you was working for somebody else. You can't take a day off. You can't be like, well, I'll get back to it Tuesday. No, by Tuesday, you're going to mess up and miss money. You need a system. You need a system. How do I explain it? When, when God created the world, the universe, what we call the universe, uh, he created what we call the solar system. The planets, the moon, the stars, he put them in motion. And he put those things so much in motion that he just, they just continue to operate. The seasons come every year. It's not depending, it's not God getting up and yawning and scratch and decide, I'm going to put the sun in the sky today. That's not how that works. In fact, Greek mythology would teach that there was a God who would get in a chariot and he would ride across the sky. And that what we call sun up to sun down was some God who was on a chariot that rode across the sky. He had to get up every day and get in the chariot and ride. But that's not true. God set a solar system in place. And what we call the changing of the seasons is something that God already set in place one time. He ain't got to get up and do it every day. He ain't got to sit up there and turn the planets around. He set it on a system, on a clock. And if you're going to be effective in your life, you got to set up some systems in your life. And you have to subject your feelings to your system. What we do is we subject our systems to our feelings. But what you need is a system, something that you do consistently, a process that you do all the time. Let me give you some more word, Pastor, because you're getting too far from me. What am I saying? Get organized. Get organized. Organize your money. Organize your family. Organize your life. Get organized. The more organized you are, the more effective you're going to be. That ain't spiritual. When Jesus got ready to feed 5,000, he set them out on the grass in order. He wasn't just throwing bread out there. As hungry as they were, as famished as they were, and ready to faint, God said there'll be no miracles until we get order. And if you're wondering why you're not experiencing breakthroughs and orders, breakthroughs and miracles, it could be because you ain't got no system. When you get order, God said, I'll release miracles. Get organized. Oh my God, I can't hold it. I got to get out. Get organized. Get organized. When, when, when the Egyptians, when the, when the Israelites came out of Egypt, they didn't come out of Egypt like a mob. They came out, and the Bible says, in course. 
They came out in order. They came out like an army, an organized army. So much so that when their enemies saw them coming across the wilderness, they were afraid because of how organized they were. When the enemy sees us hitting this city, they need to see how organized we are. Not just how emotional we are. Not just how hot we are. But how organized we are. That's what's going to intimidate the enemy. If we're going to close the back door to our church, we need systems and processes. Some of us, we've been praying for laborers. Send me some volunteers. Send me some help. And God sends you to help. But you can't keep them. In fact, as long as this church has been here, if you had all the people that ever came through your doors still here, you wouldn't be able to get everybody in the building. If all the people who came through here and visited or became members are still, you wouldn't be able to get everybody in the building. So when you see people going out the back door, we have to ask the question, how do we close the back door? With systems and processes. Sometimes we pray for good people. And it's not that they're bad people. You just have bad systems. You have bad systems. You pray, God, send me volunteers to help me with the media. Send me volunteers to help me with the greeters. Send me volunteers to be in the band. And God sent you good people, but you didn't have no good process. What about me? You had no process. You had no training. You had no follow up. You had no follow through. You had no accountability. You had no process for rewarding people who did good. And you had no consistent standard for correcting those gently who did bad. You simply had no process. God sent the fish. You just didn't have nothing to keep them. Oh, God. Ooh, God. Is it possible that God sent you money, but because you're not on a system of tithing and offering and saving, you lost money? That the greatest thing that tithing does is it teaches you a system. It teaches you consistency. Consistently giving, consistently saving, and that God is training you through your giving. Because when you don't handle money right, it can be a curse on your life. It's a proven fact that those people who get a windfall, hit the lottery for 30, 40 million dollars in five years, they end up in bankruptcy. Why? Because they have no system. They don't know how to handle money. It's not just getting money. It's managing money. It's not just having a family. It's managing the family. God said, wherever I see order, I'll send miracles. When I see you getting your money together, when I see you calling a family meeting and say, we're going to call order to this family. We got rules to this family. We got a system to this family. When I say that the doors are locked at 11 o'clock and everybody that wants to be in this house need to be here at 11 o'clock, doggone it, you better be here at 11 o'clock or you stay wherever you were. I don't care if you got to sleep outside on a step like a cat. Why? Because I got order. <laughs> <laughs> you laughing. Call my kids. They'll tell you. I was serious about that. Because I locked down everything at a certain hour. And you should see my kids rushing home trying to get in the house because they knew daddy wasn't playing. You ain't got no system. Even when you gently correct people, you don't have no standard for how you correct them. You correct certain people this way and you do something different for somebody else. And everybody knows you have no standards. It just depends on whether I like you or not. And you wonder why you can't keep people. And you wonder why. And they were good people. I mean, they were sharp people. But you didn't have no system. This is craziness. This is... Good people don't stand around for bad systems. Number two. Are you hearing me? Are you with me? You got to develop a good rhythm. I'm almost done. Every organization has a rhythm. You got to get a good rhythm. A rhythm is simply a cadence. It's a beat. It's a tempo. You got to be able to catch the rhythm of your leader. This band over here does really well because everybody's on the same rhythm, right? We got the drummer over there. We got the keyboard over there. We got the sax over there. We got the bass player over there. If everybody on this, on this team starts to play something different or a different tempo, it would sound chaotic. All of them are talented. All of them are gifted in their own right. But if they all decide I'm going to play what I want to play, it's going to sound chaotic. It's going to be a mess. 
Same thing is true for an organization. If everybody's going to do what they want to do and everybody want to go at the pace that they want to go, it's going to be chaotic. It's going to be a mess because we are not on the same rhythm. Everybody understand what I'm saying? The same rhythm, the same tempo. It, let me do it like this. You remember when we was kids and, and you would go to a dance? Back when I was a kid, we had the house parties. Yeah, we had the house parties. And at the house party, the DJ would play the different songs, right? And he would play like fast tempo songs, and then he'd slow it down, and it'd be a slow drag. Yeah. I live for the slow drag. Uh huh. Then he'd speed it up some, and he'd do, you know, a mid range. It wasn't the same beat all the time, it would change tempos. But here was the key. If you happen to come to the party with somebody who had the dexterity, the flexibility, the elasticity to switch from slow to fast, you could dance that person all night. Yeah. When they changed the tempo, the party wasn't over. I just switched the tempo. Catching somebody's rhythm is like a dance. This is the secret to having a lasting relationship, having somebody who can switch tempo with you. <laughs> if you don't find somebody who can change tempos with you, it forces you to have to get somebody else. Because you're good with the fast dance, but you can't do the slow dance. <laughs> you keeping up with me? So when, you, so when you're with a leader with a church, you got to get somebody that catches your rhythm, catches your pace. God has a pace. God has a rhythm. If you're going to walk with God, you got to figure out God's rhythm. And you can't get mad and say, you ought to go with my rhythm. When every organization has their rhythm, has a pace, and you got to find out what is the pace of this rhythm? What is the pace of this church? What is the pace of this organization? If you're stuck doing a waltz, and now they're doing the milliwop, you don't... I had to call my kids and ask me what they're doing now. What's the dance they're doing right now? Because I don't know. But if you're stuck doing a waltz, and they're doing something else, we can't dance together. And it's not that you're a bad person. And it's not that I'm a bad person. Stop demonizing people because they're not on your rhythm. You just got to find somebody who has your pace. What's your pace? Your priorities. What's important to you? What's important to the vision of this church, of this house? You got to find people who connect with the vision of your department, of your ministry. If you're over the deacons, you got to get everybody on your pace. You can't have an organization where everybody's doing whatever they want to do. we got to find out what is the goal? What are we trying to do? What is the agenda? And then I'll get with your pace. Is it possible that they're not following because you have not articulated your rhythm? <laughs> My teaching says, am I in the house? Don't let anybody break your rhythm. Don't let anybody break your rhythm. I have to say that, emphasize, I have to emphasize that. I have, I have known sisters who were, who were doing their thing, man. I mean, doing their thing, had their stuff together. Man, you know, by herself, single woman. You got your car, you got your house, you got your C-A-R, you got your A-P-T, you got your J-O-B, you got your head tight, your mind right, the body tight, everything going on. And then you get with somebody who does not have your rhythm. And mess up everything that you was trying to build. You were on a pace. You were on a rhythm. You were on a track. You were going somewhere. But you got with somebody who didn't share your priorities. They don't share your priorities about money. They don't share your priorities about God. They don't share your priorities about service. They don't share your priorities about raising children. They just don't share anything except they're just cute. And you traded your rhythm because they was cute. But what you have to do is wait on somebody who's got your rhythm. Oh, my God, I'm dropping bombs in here. I'm preaching better than you're responding. You got to wait on somebody that's got your rhythm, who's got your pace, who shares your priorities, who can get on your page. The thing about people of God is we want God to go at our pace instead of getting on God's pace. Sometimes God is moving fast. Sometimes he's moving slow. Sometimes he's moving mid-range. Sometimes he's saying, just stop. But if you're going to walk with God, you've got to make sure you stay in pace with him. 
It's not staying in pace with me. It's not my personality. If there's anything I can do for this church, we're going to change into being a a, a purpose-driven church versus being a personality-driven church. Because personalities change all the time. If you're a purpose-driven church, we can change the leadership, but we still got the purpose. You keep changing. I remember, <laughs> God, I hate getting up here sometime and telling my stories. I, I remember one sister called me, one of my friends, I have to say it to her, one of my friends in another city that said, I'm going to another church, Pastor. I said, where are you going? I'm going to so-and-so, so-and-so church. I said, why? She said, because he's cute. I said, because he's cute. You ain't saying about his preaching, his teaching, his leadership, his style, his vision, nothing. Look how far we've come where we care so little about our soul that we will follow somebody because of how they look. I like the way he sings, so I'm going to go, wait a minute, what's his vision? If you put the purpose down right, the purpose will outlive you. We can change the players, but the game doesn't change. So so so-and-so is over the greeters now and not so-and-so. So what? We can switch out the parts as long as we still got the purpose. Have you got a vision? Have you got a purpose? Do you understand what God has sent us here to do? Or are you going to continue to build your ministry, your vision, your family based on your personality, but have no order and no structure for your house? There's got to be a system to it. Last thing, and I'm almost done. Oh, my God. Are you getting something out of this? Don't let nobody break your rhythm. Don't let nobody break your rhythm. There's a whole lot of things that can come along that'll try to break your rhythm, sis. There's a whole lot of things that come along, bruh, that'll try to break your rhythm. You gotta watch them. They slick, they fast, they be trying to get you messed up. You gotta watch. Don't break my rhythm. And if you're gonna break my rhythm, just leave me alone. If you ain't gonna do me right, just leave me alone. If you ain't gonna support me, get out of my way. Oh my God. I get sick of people talking about, I'm supporting you from afar. No, you ain't supporting me at all. If you're gonna help me, help me. If you're not, sit down. <laughs> Last thing, because they flashing at me now. <laughs> you got to develop a good focus. You need a good system. Go back and look at all your systems. Your money, your kids, your house. Go back and check out your... We all have a system. This might not be a good one. Secondly, go back and figure out what's the rhythm, what's the pace. Even as a pastor, if you're going to serve in this church, you got to figure out what my rhythm is. What's my pace? What's my pace? Right? Where where are we going with this? How can I get in the rhythm? I want to dance with you for a lifetime, but I can't be doing the dance that I'm doing and walk with you. So the last thing is you got to develop focus. Once I got my rhythm, I got to develop focus. At one point, even Jesus' closest friends tried to to break his focus. If there's anything that will keep you distracted, it's your flesh and your friends. Your flesh and your friends will keep you distracted. At one point, Peter grabbed Jesus by the arm. When Jesus started talking, he got to go to the cross. He got to go to Jerusalem. And then he's got to go in the Son of Man. He said, oh, no, you ain't. Oh, no, you ain't. You ain't going. Because Peter didn't discern that Jesus' destiny was tied to this cross. That he was born for this. That his whole reason for coming was to go to the cross. And you always got somebody in your ear that's talking about, well, if I was you, I wouldn't do that. If I was you, I wouldn't sacrifice my time. If I was you, I wouldn't sacrifice myself for no church. If I was you, I wouldn't give to no church to no man. If I was you, you always got somebody in your ear that discourages you from serving, from giving, from making yourself available. And you know it. Yeah, you wait. Looking at me, you got friends around you right now who get on the phone and say, "I don't know. Why would you do that? Why would you sacrifice your time? Why would you give up your money? Why would you make yourself available?" And they're always in your ear. But what they don't understand is that my destiny is tied to this moment. My destiny is tied to this moment. It ain't even about the pastor. It's not even about the church. It's not even about the mothers. It's not about the name on it. I, my destiny is tied. I was born 
to make a difference. And when you're in my ear trying to keep me from sacrificing, see, I sacrifice because I get joy out of it. The Bible said that for the joy that was set before him, Jesus endured the cross. For the joy, ain't nothing sexy, ain't nothing fun, ain't nothing convenient about going to no cross. But for the joy that was set before him, God said, I see something on the other side of this. It's the joy that made me serve, not a check. It wasn't a check that made me serve. It was a calling that made me serve. In fact, the check doesn't even begin to cover what it cost me. Oh, see, y'all can't handle that. You, you talking about a check? A check? It ain't the check that brought me. It was a calling. It was something in me that was tied to this moment. And the joy I get out of it is on the other side. See, I know how it is. When you see people up front preaching and singing and dancing, whatever, we make it look easy. We do. We, you know, Sarita Godbear got to singing that song. We, they, they make it look easy. They just get up there and open their mouth and see. But what they don't see are the hours of sacrifice that you made that nobody saw. The preparation, the time, the things you gave up that you really wanted to do, the place you wanted to go but you couldn't because you wanted to be available to serve. And all you people that sit around talking about, I'm too tired to serve. You're only 13. How are you going to be tired? I got to talk. <laughs> Oh, Lord, I got to talk to Miss, uh, Miss Davis over here, and she was talking about how I'm the oldest member in this church. And I ain't going to tell you her age, because she ain't tell you, I ain't going to tell you. But Miss, I'm telling you, Miss Willie, when you came in here that, that one Sunday and went to dancing, and you came in on a cane after we had been praying for you, Miss Davis, we had been praying for you. We heard you was in the hospital, and we was praying for you and everything, and I was concerned and worried, and everybody, every, every week asking, how's she doing? How's she doing? And you came in here on a cane, praising God at XYZ age. I ain't going to tell you age, see? And when I see these young people walking around, I'm tired. I'm tired, child. Church is too long. I'm tired. How are you going to be tired if she can come in here at her age? With a cane, giving God praise. I know you can do better than that. My, my destiny is tied to this moment. That's what it is. It's destiny. See, some of you that God has called to serve, it's not even about recognition. It's not even about the money. It's not even about anybody giving me position. It's that my heart is to serve. It's the joy I do it for, not the recognition. It's hearing God say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. When I come in the church and I give God sacrifice and I worship, I have to remember the fact that just five years ago or ten years ago, I had a needle sticking out of my arm or I was sitting in somebody's jail cell. How is it that you could be comfortable sitting in somebody's jail cell, but you can't sit in church for 45 minutes? Get off of me. I wish you would sit there and act like you don't want to be here. When I think about the things he pulled me out of, when I think about the situations he dragged me away from, when I think about the situations that should have, I should have been dead. I should have been killed. I should have had AIDS. Oh, y'all not going to go with me. I should have been in the hospital. I should be somewhere strung out. I should be into somebody's prison. But God has delivered me and set me free. And since I'm free, talking about freedom, since I'm free, I'm going to give God a praise. Of the free people in the room give God a praise right here. Look at somebody and say, focus. Don't focus on what you're going through. Focus on where you're going to. On the other side of this pain is a joy. On the other side of this pain is a victory. On the other side of this pain is an anointing. Look at somebody and say, I'm going to the other side. That's what I get excited about. That's why I get joy. It's not the sacrifice. It's not the things I gave up. It's not the things I had to do without Carmen. I'm thinking about the joy on the other side. 
I want to talk to somebody who's going through a hellish situation right now. God said to tell you, there's some joy after this. After this, there will be joy. After this, there will be a dance. After this, there will be a celebration. After this, we are going to have church. After this, we are going to shout. After this, we are going to leap. After I get through this, we are going to have church. After I get through this drama right here, you ain't seen a dance yet. You ain't seen a... So you see me dance while I'm suffering. You see me dance while I'm going through it. That's why I don't like no funeral music around me when I get ready to praise the Lord. Because when I think about what God's done on the inside, I just soon leap and run all around this church because I feel a dance down on the inside. Mark, you ain't seen no dance yet. Wait till I get this weight off of me. Wait till I get these problems straightened out. Wait till I get my money together. Wait till I get my kids through school. Wait till I get my life together. Ah! Anybody know there's something good on the other side of this? Anybody know that God's got something waiting on you on the other side of this? There will be joy! The devil said you're going to die right here. The devil said you ain't going to make it through this. The devil said you're not going to get up. But tell that devil he's a liar. I will come out of this. I shall not die. But live and declare the works of the Lord. I will come out of it. I will get through this. Throw your hands up and say I will. I will. I will. I will. High five somebody and say you coming out of this. High five say you coming out of this. It looks bad now. It looks bad now. They laughing at you now. They talking about you now. You got to put pennies together now. You can't figure out which way to go right now. But on the other side of this suffering, there will be a joy. And if you suffer with him, you will reign with him. Somebody show yeah. Show yeah, somebody. Stay focused. Look at somebody say, stay focused. Don't let the devil deter you. Don't let him turn you around. Don't get discouraged. Don't get mad. Don't blow your brains out. Stay around. Now we are it. That's why I ain't going nowhere, Mark. I cried too many nights. I suffered too many nights. I went through it out too many times. I cried out to God too many times. Ain't no devil going to chase me out of my blessing. Look at somebody say, it ain't going to happen. It ain't going to happen. It ain't going to happen. I'll still be here. It ain't going to happen. Let me close with this. Jesus said that any man who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom. God is telling somebody, now that you got your hand on the plow, you got to stick with it. You got to stay focused. When you had your hand on the plow, you had to focus on some object down the road so that you could keep a straight line. If you were somebody who couldn't keep focused, you'd get off and you would injure yourself or mess up your plans. And God said, you got to focus on me. You can't focus on people. You got to focus on me. That's why some people can't go to church. You keep focusing on the preacher. You keep focusing on the people. You keep focusing on the choir. You keep focusing on the terms. But you got to be somebody who can focus on Jesus. You're not going to talk to me. You're not going to talk to me. Look at somebody say, stay focused. Stay focused. The devil's going to throw everything at you to make you break your focus. That's why some of us, we have our, our, our inconsistent in our worship. And all it is, I can always tell. I can always tell, Carmen, when the saints are going through something. I can always tell. Because when they got the stimulus check mark... Oh, we going to dance. I got my stimulus check. But when you ain't getting no money to was waiting on, you come in depressed, you come in tired, you come in weak. 
But God says, I want you to be somebody who is consistent in your praise with me. <laughs> I want you to do like the old folks used to do. They used to give me an anyhow praise. You know what anyhow praise is? I got to tell these young people what anyhow praise is. And anyhow praise, what the kind of praise you gave God when you thank God, anyhow. Money was funny, but you praise God, anyhow. Boyfriend broke up with me, but I praise God, anyhow. Lost my job, but I praise God, anyhow. Because we knew that if you live long enough, that God will bring you out of it. If there's anybody in here, that's got to anyhow praise for God. I'm going to praise that anyhow. It's been a fight, but I'm going to praise him. Somebody open your mouth and give him an anyhow praise. I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. <laughs> when the devil see that you're going to praise God anyhow he'll start backing up off you when the devil see it's not going to stop your dance he'll back up off you when the devil see you still going to give him a shout he'll back up off you the secret to getting a victory is opening your mouth and praising God Wait a minute, wait a minute. Because somebody don't understand what I'm talking about. And they think I just got a new car or a new check or a new boo or a new house. But when you look at somebody and say, neighbor, neighbor. this is how you praise God. This is how you praise God. Anyhow, clap your hands up. Anyhow, I'm consistent. Anyhow. He's worthy anyhow. He's God anyhow. Yes! This is how you do it. This is how you praise God anyhow. Yeah, my kids acting crazy, but I'm praising God anyhow. My spouse acting funny, but I praise God anyhow. My money is tight, but I praise. Oh! I ain't gonna cool with you. I ain't gonna with you. Yeah, just like that. That right there. You ought to pry them right in the face of your devils, right in the face of your problems, right in the face of your issues, right in the face of your enemies. You ought to But I'm still going to make it. Thought I wasn't going to get up. But I'm still going to get up. Thought I wasn't going to get out of it. But I'm not, 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 not. You better go out of prison.
Jesus. Touch from the top of her head to the sole of her feet. God! Lift your hands right here and give God glory right here. Come on, lift your hands right here. Healing is in the house. Breakthrough is in the house. Hallelujah. Financial breakthrough is in the house. I feel somebody breaking loose right now. I feel somebody's burden of heaven is coming off you right now. Everything the devil tried to do is not working now. It's coming up off you now. Somebody shout yes in this house. Shout yes. Shout yes. Shout yes. There. Touch right there. Touch right there, Lord. Touch her right now. From the top of her head to the sole of her feet. Hallelujah. You're a healer, God. You're a deliverer. I pray for a breakthrough right now. Holy Spirit, fall on her right now. In the name of Jesus. You better go ahead and get your dancing, sis. You better get your dancing. You better get your dancing, brother. I don't know why you sitting there looking at me. You better get your dancing. You better get your shouting. You better get your pride. Y'all don't want to have church. Y'all don't want to have church in here. Yes, Is there anybody want to have church? Put your hands together. Yes, Let's have church. Yes, yeah. You better praise him, brother. You better go ahead and praise him. You better go ahead and get your shouting, boy. You better praise The power of God is here. The power of God is here. The power. Lift your hands. Lift your hands right here. Begin to worship. Lift your hands right here. Begin to worship. The power of God is falling all over this place. The Spirit of the Lord is falling all over this building from the back room all the way to the front. It's falling online where you're watching me right now. The Spirit of God is reaching right through that camera and touching you in your situation. You shall not die. You shall not fail. You will not go down. God is faithful. God is consistent. He that has begun a good work in you. Help! If you got the victory, somebody shout! Oh, Jesus! We have a day. We have a day. Oh, I don't believe they heard you. We have a day. I don't think they heard you, sis. We you gotta tell them a little bit louder. What? I don't think they believe it in here. I don't think they believe it, Carmen. I don't believe they believe it. Tell somebody I got. Tell somebody I got. I got the victory. Give God a shout right here. Give God a shout right here. If you got the victory and you're glad about it, give God a shout right here. All right. Listen. Listen. There's such an anointing 
on this atmosphere. I, I want to do something in this anointing. I want to sow a seed in this anointing. Yeah, I'm not going to have victory in my life and victory in my health and victory on my job and not have victory in my finances. Sometimes you got to sow where you're trying to go. So I want everybody under the sound of my voice to get a seed in your hand. Get a seed in your hand. What are we doing, Pastor? I'm sowing where I'm going. I'm believing God to open up a door to give us a breakthrough. If you're online right now, I want to challenge you in this moment, in the strength of this word, to trust God at his word. He's been telling you, if you trust me, that I'll come through. I'm consistent. I'm consistent. I will be there. If you sow a seed, I will make sure that seed brings a harvest. Come in, Sharita. Stop right there. Lift your hands right there. I'm just believing God for a miracle in your life. As you sow in this seed, you've been sowing seeds of service. You've been sowing seeds of finances. But I believe that God's going to cause you to reap a harvest. The harvest you're expecting is bigger than you expect. Did you hear what I said? God said to tell you it's bigger than you expect. Somebody better catch up. God said it's bigger than you expect. It's bigger. It's bigger. It's bigger. Come on. Come here, sis. Lift your hands right here. Lift your hands. It's bigger than you expect. It's bigger than you expect. Come on. It's bigger than that. 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 Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. I wish I had somebody was excited. I wish I had somebody was excited. Come here, sis. Wait a minute. I'm believing God for sicker. It's bigger than you expect. God said to tell you, you ain't seen nothing yet. You ain't seen what I'm getting ready to do. Everything you've seen in the past is going to pale compared to what I'm getting ready to do now. Lift your hands and give him glory right. So, I feel like leaping. You need to sow a seed in this. You need to sow a seed in this. Come here, Sister Thornton. Come here, come here, come here, grab her right there. Turn her around. God said to tell you. God said to tell you. Get ready for a harvest. Get ready for a breakthrough. Get ready for a miracle. If you're watching me online, you see these people running up here sowing a seed. It's because there's an anointing in this house and we're believing God for a harvest. If you're an impact partner, if you're not a partner, if you're watching me today or watching me tonight or watching me this week or whatever you watch, I want to challenge you to sow a seed into this anointing. This is going to be a change in the season. Come on, pull out your give the pie app and begin to sow into this anointing right here. God's going to cause you to call this increase in your life. God's going to call you to reap it. Reap a harvest. Reap a harvest. Reap a harvest. Reap a 